Please welcome John Elliott, designer John Elliott, with Alex Padilla, style director WWD, John Elliott のデザイナー John Elliott 氏、そして WWD スタイルディレクターアレックス・バディア氏をご歓迎ください。Let's have fun. <laughs> so, obviously, you and I know each other for a long time, but can you please tell the rest of the audience a little bit about you? Yes,、uh, first of all, thank you for having me.、Um, so honored to be here. I, I love Tokyo, I love Japan.、Um, really, you know, been a great week so far. I'm John Elliott、um, from San Francisco, California.、Um, like, I guess around like eight years old, nine years old, I kind of had this like. Intuition that like, I wanted to try to start my own company. At that time, it was a skate company.、Mm-hmm. Um, super dyslexic, and、uh, instead of like, paying attention to、uh, like, social studies or、mm-hmm. mathematics, I found myself sketching sneakers, and my mom was、uh, encouraging, me, encouraging me to send them to Nike. So、uh, the rest is kind of history for that. So you did send your sketches to Nike? I did, yes. So, as, as crazy as it is to say this,、um, at eight years old, I was sketching sneakers、um, you know, in class,、I'd、come home, show the designs to my mom, and she encouraged me to, to actually send them off to Nike. So,、um, yeah, now, you know. Cool mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they actually sent you a letter back, right? They did, yeah. So, this, this leather right here is kind of now, like, you know. Uh, that we've had the brand for like six years. It's kind of hollowed inspiration.、Um, we, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing to think that like, we actually we have a Nike collaboration, and you know, more than 20 years ago, I was dreaming of this day. You actually, obviously, as you just said, you collaborated with Nike, right? How was that? Yeah, so that was pretty incredible. You know, I think、um, being a kid that is basically a swoosh lifer,、um, mm-hmm. having the ability to now tap into both their heritage and、um, you know, their like, performance, it's, it's been a dream come true. They're incredible partners. Last year, we, we launched、uh, the Nike Vandal,、mm-hmm. and I think 2018、um, will actually be like, our biggest year yet with them. We have a, a lot of projects in store. You know, I love a Nike, but let's, let's pull back a little bit and let's talk about when and why you decided to launch John Elliott. Yeah, so、um, I had worked in the industry for about 10 years,、mm-hmm. and I was leaving one job and I moved to New York. And、uh, from New York, I actually ended up going back to LA, and this all happened in about a two and a half year span. And just in the process of packing and packing all my stuff up, I realized that I had so much trend. I had so much stuff that didn't resonate more than like a couple months, a couple wears.、Mm-hmm. And I had this hypothesis as like a, almost a collector that if I could build almost a wardrobe for myself, solve my own problems, then I might have a proposition that could work. So we started with three categories、um, French terry, jersey, and denim. And I felt、mm-hmm. like those were the essential building blocks for. My own wardrobe, and、um, yeah, we started out as like a little bit of a basics brand,、um, started to build the brand up,、uh, took about two years, and then、um, just as I was probably so naive to think that Nike would、um, you know, <laughs> accept one of my designs, we went to New York Fashion Week and started to present our collections on the runway. So, you did a show in 2015? Yes, 2015 was the first. This is, your, this is the first show. The first、yes. show? Exactly right. So, I was there. <laughs> you were there, yes,、mm-hmm. front and center.、Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I think we did not truly understand、yes. um, the stage and you know, what we were kind of the arena that we were entering,、mm-hmm. but at the same time, it paid off.、Um, mm-hmm. That particular show kind of strapped our business to a rocket ship, so to speak. Um, I think we grew by over 10 times after that, that first show, and、yes. uh, it changed everything.、Um, everything from logistics to new hires to just the product assortment, it all improved and it, it drove us forward. So it was a huge milestone for the brand. I remember I walked in,、um, I, I knew you already a little bit, and I sat down, and then five minutes later, I hear this commotion, and it's Kanye West.、Yeah. He comes in and sits next to me. and... Elbows me and says, This kid is so cool. <laughs> and I'm like, Who is this kid? How did that happen? Yeah, so、um, I had met Kanye maybe like about a year earlier,、mm-hmm. and we had kind of just 
had, I think, I hope mutual respect. I obviously had respect for mm -hmm. him. And um, I was kind of like working on some stuff with him when he was launching Yeezy Season 1. And um, yeah, I got a call. I wasn't expecting him. And I got a call about 20 minutes prior to the show. Um, hey, Kanye's on the w on the way. Would you mind holding the show? And I was like, guys, <laughs> guys, <laughs> hold the show. Yeah. Jesus is coming. Yeah, Jesus is coming. <laughs> so yeah, it would, you know, I think the coolest thing about that is um, we didn't truly understand a what we were doing in terms of mm -hmm. ha like <clears throat> launching on the runway. But then him coming to that first show, it brought along with it the world's attention, right. worldwide eyes. Right. And um, that put us on a platform where, you know, it was like, okay, you can make this a legitimate business now, or, you know, you can just be one of those brands that had, like, a really interesting proposition mm -hmm. for one season, and boom, you're gone. And I'm happy to say that we, we really buckled down, worked hard, and, you know, grew from that. Can you define the ethos, that you, what you're talking about, your brand? Yeah, so I think, you know, really our brand is a brand that makes clothes for now both men and women that literally can be worn every single day. I think that we make products that at its core are meant to be worn every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think that, like, it's, it's a proposition that is really, like, I want to I own your whole wardrobe. It started with me solving my own problems with my own closet, and mm -hmm. now we've expanded, you know, obviously into footwear. We've now expanded into women's. But the, the ethos is the same. Make products that matter. Make products that people will, will wear every single day. And it, it's unbranded. Um, I, I think that, you know, for the most part, we try to use super high-quality uh, materials and beautiful manufacturing f uh, facilities and really try to, like, give a value proposition with, like, a fashion element. So you're talking about owning the closet of your consumer. It means that you want to have a very intimate relationship with your consumer. How do you engage them. So I'm so glad you asked me about this. This is something that um, I'm, I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, I think that like when we first started the business, because we started the business with a very small amount of money. Like yes. in fact, how much? Um, we started with thirty thousand dollars. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So um, my my business partner and I. Um, I was actually sleeping on this floor, and mm -hmm. I was saving every check that I was making from my, my job. And we came up with this business plan, and we cobbled together fifteen thousand dollars each. And we um, we basically went out and we started to like you know look for sample facilities. And when we went and started to talk to people, they were like, "You're crazy! You, this will not work." I mean, they were kind of right. We needed more money, right? But um, you know, to go from that, I think we've always kind of been in survival mode. Mm -hmm. So from season one, mm -hmm. we, it was adapt or die. Right. So when we delivered those first products, yes. we couldn't wait six months to collect like, from wholesale. So we had to launch online, and we had to have products that would sell. Right. So from season one, we had to figure out a way to engage our customers, right. speak with them, excite them, and sell product. So right now, our breakdown of our business is probably about 70% through our own channels and 30% through um, wholesale. And That's incredible. It's the, thank you. Um, and I think it's a, a huge part because of the conversation that we have with our customers every single day. Mm -hmm. We made the conscious choice um, that basically we didn't want to focus on every uh, social media channel. We weren't going to try to do Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, mm -hmm. and own them all. We said, okay, we're going to focus on Instagram. And then we found this outlier that was a little bit interesting. It was called Styleform. And it's like an okay. old, old school chat room style. Like AOL style? I, I would like to think of it as better than that, but maybe a little similar. You okay. So uh, these forms where guys discuss what, how they wear our products and what you know is fashionable really became an avenue for us to engage with them. So we actually speak directly to them in the forum. So we we have a direct discussion with our customers through Instagram and this, this forum, which is called Style Forum, on a daily basis. So it just happened. I hate that word. Sorry to use it, but it happened organically. Um, 
it, we hired a a kid that yeah. was like, hey, I I think I think we had we could maybe market this a little bit differently, and he he. His big idea was to use a form, and to me, I was like, "God, that's so corny." You know, right. I thought it was so like you know, nineteen ninety seven. Nineteen ninety seven. But um, modem, modem style. Yeah, dial up. Yeah. But it worked. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you know, I think what it did is like it created a layer of transparency where every single time we're dropping a product, yes. customers can tell us like, "Oh, we wish we had it like this," and we can take that information and obviously leverage it for future drops. And I think as production and, um, you know, for us, like the speed of e-commerce continues to move forward, right. the more information we have, the more we can capitalize on that. You basically were setting the basics of John Elliott. Yes, exactly. So, well, you talk about Instagram, and you took it even a step further. This spring-summer 2018, you decided to launch the collection in Instagram, but you did it differently. Can you explain us how? Yes. Yeah, so for me, yeah, this is this is the collection. The collection. Um, it was titled Field Manual. For me, I spend way too much time on my phone. Me too. Probably like all of us. And I had this idea that if you could take something like Instagram, which is so mundane at this point, and you spend so much time on, and you could excite someone by introducing something new, well, then then you might have a big idea that people will remember. Okay. Um, the other thing that I thought about was when you do a runway show, you're doing it for a very standard audience. Not standard in the mm-hmm. sense that it's like, you know, standardized, but it's, it's for a fashion community. And you're banking on certain outlets to get the brand exposure that um, you hope to achieve. But you can't control it yourself. Like, and with this Instagram idea, we came up with this concept of what if we could take a person that has, say, a high follower count, have them be look one, and then have them tag the next person. So literally, in order to see the collection, you have to go through each person's profile and uh, essentially follow along. Um, So in about 10 minutes, we could say, without doubt, that we made impressions on over 20 million people, which is kind of a novel idea, considering that, like, you you like to think that you have that power when you do a runway show, but it's not guaranteed. So you send one look, one image to one of each of those Instagram stars or influencers that you respect. Exactly. So we rolled it out over a 10-minute span. So each person was tagging the next person, and it created a chain, basically a loop, Mm -hmm. where you could click through people's profiles to view the collection, but the byproduct of that was you're also getting introduced to people that we felt were interesting. Correct. So it showed like depth in the brand. So you got yes. to see a little bit of our world as like a byproduct. You know how I feel about millennials, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a source. Let's of- go. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. And let's go. So is this a millennial company? Yes, it is a millennial. <laughs> I mean, I would like to think of myself as like on the cusp. Just come out. Yeah, I, I, yes. It's, it's a company that I think is geared to millennials. I, that's, that's who buys our products. Right. Um, so I think in order to engage with them, we need to speak the same language as them. Right. And we need to try to excite them through avenues that they want to use, but do it in a clever way. And I mm-hmm. think this Instagram um, example was, it showed curiosity on our part to break away from the standard fashion system. And it was clever in the sense that no one had really done it before. And as a result, you got to like not only experience something new, but you also hopefully got to say, oh, this is like, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy mm-hmm. this, and you know, start to be excited about the collection as well. You touched on something before about your constant communication with your, your consumer. You said that you at times are able to pers- uh, customize product or change product. Do you do that? Yeah, of course. So I think, um, you know, we have a plan, you know, for a year of like what, you know, Obviously, two main seasons, two mm-hmm. pre-seasons. Um, but what we really try to do is, like, we know that, like, our brand, ha- thank God, has turned into a... We have a little bit of a cult following. and uh, it's, You do. It's grown and grown and grown. And um, now what we've noticed is that with wholesale, we, it's better for the wholesale partner if we dictate their business, almost if we tell them what to buy. So... With our consumers online, of course, we're you know, presenting them new product every single week. But with our wholesale con- cons- customers, 
we're really kind of dictating their business because we know that if we drop a French Terry program that's going to sell out in two days yes. and they buy colors that are you know, going to be quick sellers, then that funnel just transfers to them. Mm-hmm. And if the store X doesn't have it and store Y doesn't have it or we make sure to separate colors, then the funnels just get kind of separated. So essentially it's because we're having the direct co- conversation with our consumers, yes. we almost know how to plan the business the best. So essentially, we try to plan the business for our wholesale partners as well, instead of just like having them come into the showroom and like cherry pick the collection. It's well, it's basically what Farfetch does at times by advising their their wholesaler. A, a what little to buy. bit, yeah, a little bit. It's very similar. So that's uh, basically that's an incredible. Uh, Asset. Yeah, well, I think it comes with very deep knowledge of your consumer base. Right. We have so much information and so much knowledge on not only what is currently selling, but what they're <laughs> looking for in the future, that that's why we're able to achieve this kind of business with our wholesale partners. It's, it's interesting because we were talking with, with Alex Arigato, who was presenting before, and he talked about his retail debt. Um, obviously, I don't think the retail is dead. Are you, are you, do you think retail is dead? No, no, not at all. Are you going to open your own stores? I, abs- I'm excited to say that I think in um, the not too distant future, we will have uh, created our world in, in three dimensions, which will be the project of my lifetime. I can't wait. Because with the knowledge that you have of your, of your cons- consumer base, you could definitely do many things on brick and mortar. Not only do I think we can make brick and mortar successful from a monetary standpoint, mm-hmm. but I, I think that the experience of shopping is still very like important. Not only just for brands, but you know for consumers as well. Like I think Tokyo is a great example of that. Mm-hmm. You know, the, sh- the shopping here, in my opinion, is the best in the world, and I would love to try to create a world for myself in LA and, and introduce our customers to an e- even deeper view into who we are as a brand. So you have show me Tokyo. Thank you very much. We went <laughs> shopping together the other day. Um, I know that you love Japan, but can you share your feelings about Japan to the audience, please? Yeah, I, I do love Japan. <laughs> I really love <laughs> you Japan. Do, yeah, you love Japan. I, I love Japan. I um, literally probably, I, I came here 12 times in 2017. Um, like every time before I come here, probably two days before I get on the plane, I, I, I just get this rush of excitement. And I, I think it probably has a lot to do. I was out to dinner about a year ago. And um, I learned this phrase, umami. And it's basically... Um, umami. Like, umami, yeah. It's yeah. Like, it means like the intention um, behind like a food. Like, it's like the way that it's, it starts. And it's also the intention behind like how it should taste. And um, it just was like a very eye-opening experience for me. Mm-hmm. Because it showed uh, a Japanese way, which is translated for me in shopping and... Um, you know, in a hotel experience, and obviously in eating, um, and in manufacturing. And it made so much more sense as to why the experience here is um, a little bit more meaningful. Um, I just, I absolutely cherish my time here. And luckily enough, we do about 50% of all of our production in Japan now. So starting tomorrow, I get to travel all over Japan and heading to Kojima tomorrow to go mm-hmm. work on denim. So, um, yeah. So can you talk to us about how this umami has affected your fashion business, specifically your collections? Yes, um, it's a great question. So I think, you you know, when you have, like, kind of a lens or, um, like, an idea for a collection. Yes. um, And your whole idea with a collection is trying to connect ideas through product Mm -hmm. and tell a story down the runway. Right. And when you work with incredible manufacturers who can achieve very, very detailed nuances, um, you have the ability to to tell those stories. And I think the better the manufacturers and the better your partners, the deeper the story you can tell. So that's, you know, it really translates in the product itself. Mm -hmm. You are a a fan of some Japanese brands, and at times you've done collaborations with some of the brands. Can you walk us through it? Yes. Um, So we've collaborated with Dasant, the uh, Japanese down manufacturers. This is one of them. Yes, they make technical down. Uh, I think we brought a fashion element, which is like the essence of collaboration. It was a 
beautiful collaboration. Mm -hmm. We've also collaborated with Black Means, mm -hmm. um, the Japanese leather artisans. Mm -hmm. um, we've this the jacket I'm wearing right now. They make incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we've collaborated with Loop Wheel, the uh, Japanese Terry um, manufacturers, which is like an incredible collaboration. I've was able to work with them in their knitting mill and seeing these ancient machines uh, was really kind of like once in a lifetime experience. Mm -hmm. And then Sui Coke, the uh, Japanese sandal manufacturer. So you can you can tell that like I uh, you're into it. I am yeah, very very much uh, intrigued and respect Japanese fashion and manufacturing. So and this past season, the fall winter eighteen, the show you just had, and yes. you basically took a major step forward. You decided to launch women's wear. Yes. Can you tell me why and how was it received? Well, yes. Uh, basically about. A year and a half ago, we started tailoring, um, right. and we worked on it about two years ago. And I think when, when we launched tailoring on the men's side, I realized that that was a new part of my brain, a new area of expertise that we need to learn about as a development team. And with that kind of realization, I also realized, like, oh, man, it would, I'm very curious as to what the John Elliott girl would be like. Right. And it's just such a different skill set developing a women's collection. Obviously, their bodies are more three-dimensional. The patterns are different. Fabrications are different. So, um, you know, the curiosity was there. And basically, to start the collection, we had to burn down what we thought it was going to be. 20% um, of all of our sales right now online are actually you know, are women buying the men's collection. And so we knew that um, the customer was there. And, uh, yeah, we launched it at New York Fashion Week about 10 days ago, and thank God it was very well received, and now on to the next one. So um, don't for forget about it, it says time's up, but don't worry about that. <laughs> um, these people. Um, I love I you, Alex. <laughs> it's true. No, but, like, how was the reaction of women's wear? It was, it was... From retailers, for example. I, I, from I'm, press... I read. Well, and thank you for the glowing review. Yeah, first it's true. It was I a really good it. show. Um, but no, I mean, I'm I so thankful. I'm thankful and I'm excited. It was it was a huge. It was an incredible response. Yes. And we think that um, the women's side of our business could quickly become just as meaningful as the men's side in a very short period of time. And so. Um, we're excited, you know. I mm -hmm. think we were anticipating a lot of growth. A lot of growth. Yeah. Retailers responded well. Yes, yes. Uh, it's in Paris right now, so yeah, they yeah. So what's next? Next is probably just more growth. Uh, growth, uh, commitment to e-com, commitment to running our company. I think one thing that we do that is interesting is we try to run the company at, like it's a dual company, both right. fashion and uh, like an e-commerce company, almost like a tech startup. Mm -hmm. So continuing to hone um, the business on the tech side and like the e-com side while also pushing forward and continuing to, to hone the craft, get better with men's and with women's. Thank you, John, for coming here. Oh, thank Hold you on. so much, Alex. We thank do you, have guys. time. And could you put on the translation receiver just in case? Oh, yeah, just in case. We do have time for some questions, so please go ahead. Hi. Thank you. That was so interesting. Um, <laughs> I find it really interesting that you're so um, inspired by Japan and you love Japan. Do you have any um, plans to have a retail presence in Japan or to grow your business here? Uh, it's a great question. And I, I can tell you that we absolutely plan, we hope to grow in Japan. Um, we have a, a meaningful business now, but we're, we're excited to continue to add more partners and continue to grow. Uh, for me, the dream is to have my own dedicated, our own dedicated shop in Tokyo. Um, for me, like I said, Tokyo is the mecca of shopping. Tokyo is the mecca of experience and being able to curate your own world. Originally, I was hopeful that Tokyo would be the first location for a standalone John Elliott store. But then reality set in, and I realized that if we're really going to do this, I need to make sure that this shop runs perfectly and I'm going to want to be hands-on. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes the most sense to open in L.A. first um, and then probably go to New York in uh, Tokyo next. But it's definitely in the plans. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, you know, coming from where we've come from to be here and talking about this, like, it's kind of ridiculous, honestly. <laughs> uh, 
Any other questions? Yes. Put it on. Thank you for presentation. Um, since uh, you are familiar with the Japanese market, in your point of view, I would like to hear weak part of a Japanese market. Oh, I'm sorry. The what weak was, part? The weak part of the weak Japanese part. part? Yes. What is it? Weak? Ooh, wow, that is a good question. Um, you know, I think that the Japanese market is um, it's the only thing that is rough about the Japanese market is sometimes. Tradition can um, shackle a little bit of creativity, and so for us, um, you know, we have had the opportunity to what I felt like move forward with, uh, say, a standalone store. But there, are, there's just there's a lot of tradition that gets in the way of us, like as a younger brand, being able to to trudge forward. So, I, you know, it's. It's a process that I'm learning more and more, and I respect, and I'm committed to, and I think it will happen in time. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you mentioned you used Styleform, which was the forum yes. um, where people were talking about your brand. Can you help us understand how did you actually use that forum? What, what, how were you engaging with them and what Good was question. it that you were using it to better understand? Yeah, that's a great question. So we started off by just introducing ourselves as a new brand with a link to our website and uh, some photos of our products. And because we had delivered to wholesale already, kids who are constantly looking for new brands and are very, I would say, active in the fashion community they went and checked the products out, and they immediately validated that the products were worth, worthy of attention. And it created a conversation, which, which we obviously took part in and said, like, thank you for your feedback, thank you for taking part. And it just it, it started a conversation. Um, we also we had a product uh, in our first season that was like a, a star product. Um, we have a sweatshirt that has uh, two side zippers, and it conceals an interior kangaroo pocket. And um, nobody knew my name. There was n no one knew who John Elliott was. There was no reason to know my name. And um, we were being sold at really high-profile stores in New York City. And uh, this product sold out in like five days. And it was really a testament to the product itself. So then the conversation shifted from you know, the brand, this new brand is a good brand that's worthy of your attention to um, where can I find this sweatshirt? And so once it shifted from like, is this brand good, is it not good, to where can I find this product, it, it, the conversation took a life of its own. And it really became more of, a, you know, us trying to help people find where they could buy our stuff. Um, and that's where, once we realized that, oh, wow, like, Things were selling out in New York in five days. You know, we would launch it online and it would sell out in five minutes. And so then it kind of became like, okay, we're going to give you guys the heads up on the drop. We're mm -hmm. going to be launching it on Monday morning at 8 a.m. so that those kids who are really following the brand, they would know when to get it. So it almost became like a little bit of like an insider club. And so then we had like this inside conversation, and once that happened, we had some pretty hardcore followers because we were, you know, treating them well, and and then we were also getting a lot of press. So the piece was very sought after, and it kind of gave them social equity, if you will. So they felt like they were a part of the brand. So then they became like brand advocates. That's great. Thanks, John. Given what you did with Instagram in the past, how will you maintain, will you do it again? And then how will you readapt it going forward? Great question. Um, I think in order to leverage Instagram um, in a way where a conversation really gets started and people really, really pay attention, I think you have to have a, a really new idea. Mm -hmm. I think you have to, you know, I think any time you can take something that is so mundane and so common and so just a part of your life and you can twist it in a way that it shocks someone, well, that's how you 
pull them in emotionally and create a sense of excitement. So the only way that I would do that again is if, the idea, if I had a brand new radical idea. I would not try to repu- replicate the formula because we've already done it. And um, you know, it's just not quite as exciting if, uh, if it's been done before. Thank you. This is all the time we have for questions. Thank you guys. Thank you.